Hi, everybody. I'm Rachel Chanoff, the Director of Office Performing Arts and Film and the co-producer of Banks A Call. We are thrilled and delighted that you're joining us today for this panel, which is entitled Cambodia, um, From Cambodia to the World, Creative Co Collaboration Among Unlikely Partners. The event is part of the Arts and Healing Banks A Call Virtual Festival, which is co-presented uh, co between Cambodian Living Arts and Arts Emerson and made possible thanks to the support of the Ministry of Culture of Taiwan and the collaboration of 50 other partners and artists from seven countries. Uh, today's event is contributing to HowlAround Theater Commons, a free and open platform for theater makers worldwide. It'll be focused on the commissioning process of Banksicall, a requiem for Cambodia. Um, we, the office got involved in Banksicall as producers early, early on and our mission was really to um, bring this profound and compelling work to the world because it, the beauty of it in, is it so specifically speaks to a Cambodian experience that resonates globally and um, with all of humanity and so important, especially now when um, there are genocides that have happened before and after, and it's a story that must be told so that hopefully humanity learns from it and we don't keep repeating this horrific event. Um, to make anything happen in theater, it takes a whole ecosystem. It takes the art, brilliant artists who conjure up the work, but it also takes uh, the collaboration of the people who are going to produce it and present it. And the presenters are people who have commissioned it um, and brought money to it and brought audiences to it and brought their institutions to it. In this case, it was commissioners from across the world led by Joe Malillo, who was at BAM, and Stephen Armstrong, who was at the Melbourne Festival, and um, also David Dower from Arts Emerson. And they really were key in making this happen. They, Joe Malillo decided that this was a piece that needed to speak to the world. And he, as a leader in the field, really gathered the troops from across the world to um, have everybody come together and make, the, make this piece be possible. So today we're going to hear from all of the presenters, uh, from the commissioners who were key players in making this happen. And to guide us through this panel is a woman who is a total force in our international ecology of arts and presenting. She's the executive director of the Hong Kong Festival, but she's also an extraordinary advocate for art and she's an author and she is an important uh, campaigner for women's causes. And she is someone who has been instrumental in bringing art all over, from all over the world um, and creating a platform where artists can be heard. So we are so honored to have with us, to guide us through Tisa Ho. Before we move to the panel, we have a video from Stephen Armstrong, who's the creative director of the Art Center at Melbourne, who unfortunately couldn't join the discussion today, but was so important to the process. He came early on to our first workshop in Cambodia and thought so deeply about the progress, how the creative process and who could be involved and should be involved in making this project and really the creation of this project. So Stephen has some words for us and here they are. I'm Stephen Armstrong and I'm creative director for the Asia Topa program at Art Centre Melbourne. And it was my pleasure to collaborate with Pluen Prim and Rachel Chernoff to help bring the premiere of Banks of Coal to the stage in Melbourne in October 2017. I'm really sorry, I can't be with you. Um, I've been called up to do what's called jury duty here, keeping our democracy alive in Melbourne. Uh, I know where I would rather be, um, but um, please accept my apologies. Melbourne is home to the largest Cambodian community in Australia. Um, most of the Cambodian community here arrived as refugees in the 1970s and 80s. 
So on average, they were in their 20s. Uh, by the time we presented Banks a call, most would have been parents and grandparents of second generation Cambodian Australians, uh, many of whom, uh, as I understand it, did not know their family stories. Uh, the truth is that while we've all grown up together in multicultural Australia, Khmer culture, along with many Southeast Asian cultures, is really not very often seen on our main stages, something that I work very hard to counter. Um, so when I met Plu and Prim, and I think it was in Tokyo, um, and I heard about the work of Cambodian living arts, before I knew it, I'd changed my flights and I was heading to Phnom Penh. I doubt that I'm the first person this has happened to. Um, and as luck would have it, CAL was hosting a symposium on art in a post-trauma society. Um, and when I think about that subject uh, from an Australian standpoint, there is nothing post about the living trauma of Australia's First Nations people um, and the generational inheritance of so many migrants living in Australia. So the subject is a really important one, uh, and especially through the lens of the Cambodian experience. The visit had quite an impact on me, uh, not just visiting the sites of the Khmer Rouge atrocities, uh, but also enjoying the vitality of Khmer culture today and the, um, the extraordinary uh, vitality and virtuosity and imagination of contemporary and traditional performances that I saw both in Phnom Penh and Siem Reap. Um, one of the things that really struck me was spending time at Bhopana and exploring the documentary archives uh, with Riti Pan um, after viewing his film, The Missing Picture. Um, in that context, that was a very powerful experience. The impossible beauty of Riti's work filled me with a kind of need to be part of this project, to bring the Australian community through his art of survival and resistance together. Uh, the promise of, of nurturing a future through the imagination. Um, and even more so, I can't think of a more significant thing to commit one's self to now in this very fragile century. And the more I learned about Ruti's concept, the banks of coal and him, Sophie's amazing music, I literally began to imagine it on the stage of Art Centre Melbourne. Uh, and by now, of course, I was completely in the thrall of Pluin and Rachel. Um, I knew there was no getting out of it. We were in this together. I also began to think about how singular and authentic moments in art demand really new vocabularies. Uh, we build on the forms of traditional and innovation simultaneously to try and give voice to the present, um, even when that's tethered to the past. Banks of Coal was not only an eye-watering poetic song cycle and film, it was the dynamics of performance by Him Savi and Bell and Sam A and the traditional and Western instrumentalists and the extraordinary chorus from Taiwan. Um, there was a narrative being created through the placement and movement of live bodies on stage which needed to acknowledge the immediacy of Him's score and the enormity of Ruti's images uh, and the emotions that both held. Um, but what worried me was how the spirits of the, um, the, the murdered uh, were going to be freed if their families and relatives now living in Melbourne weren't integral to this event. In the conversations that we'd had together, I was really aware that bringing the Melbourne Festival into this partnership as a major presenter, which we definitely needed to do and bless them, um, both to secure the financial resources, but also to give it the artistic status that it needed as a major international work. That this also risked the performance being thought of as an exclusive or elite event, um, especially as we were presenting it in Melbourne Arts Centre's very beautiful, but also quite prestigious concert hall. Um, and it wasn't just possible, it was actually probable that most members of the local Cambodian community had never been to Arts Centre Melbourne. It made us ask ourselves, why should this community trust us with their story? Why should they pay money to come to Arts Centre Melbourne to experience their own culture? These were important questions. Uh, and the solutions uh, needed to be found, I felt, we felt, in the art itself.
in how the work was actually finally conceived for the stage. The work needed to insist its own authority. Um, and certainly we couldn't think about marketing the work as a separate activity. We needed to build community connection into the actual producing and connect the imagination of the creators with the imaginations of the audience uh, as a fundamental act. We needed to think of Banks of Coal not as a film and song cycle, but as a requiem, a staged ritual and an event where things are literally enacted as well as felt. And we needed a stage director to serve Ritty and him's vision while bringing all of these elements together. I proposed Australian choreographer and theatre artist uh, Gideon Abizanik. Gideon has been specialising for many years in creating events which dissolve the distance between the stage and the auditorium. Um, Gideon's work also has always showed the great strength of choreographic sensibility in shaping physical and emotional experience through the push and pull of music and imagery in real time, and how to create an alternative experience of time through ritual and gesture. Uh, our hopes for Banks of Coal were nothing short of connecting the living with the spirits of the forgotten, to create a space for the past and the present to occur simultaneously, um, and in doing so to free the future. So while Ritty and Gideon resolved how this was going to be presented uh, through the beautiful river of life, uh, created on stage um, and the extraordinary moments with the young people. Back at home, I was working with a woman named Cedar Douglas uh, and her colleague Sambath Kim um, for quite a few months to socialise the project. And we did this primarily through Khmer Radio um, and through Melbourne's Buddhist temples. Uh, we produced information in Khmer, we organised transport. At the right hour, many of our uh, local community could not afford to take time off work, which meant traveling at dinner time, which meant making sure that we had buses that could accommodate their families um, and provide meals on those buses, appropriate food. Uh, it was really important to us that when they returned for the opening night performance, they were returning. They were comfortable with the protocols and relaxed about bringing their kids and their food into the building. We made hard copy tickets available to avoid the problem of credit cards. We'd been advised that uh, credit is not um, popular among the Cambodian community. And we also obviously invited the monks in to ritually cleanse the space. Um, understanding the potential distress of this work uh, and the fact that many families had not seen uh, Khmer culture performed on a general public stage or seen any imagery from the genocide represented through artworks. We screened the missing picture and we hosted a large community event uh, with some of the original artists from um, Phnom Penh uh, in the weeks before the premiere. This also gave us the opportunity to introduce the artists to Melbourne's media so they could understand their responsibility in reporting the event. Um, we were overjoyed when more than 500 community members volunteered to be part of the performance, uh, which enjoyed a fantastic and highly emotional um, and an unforgettable response from full houses. Um, the concert hall at Arts Centre Melbourne seats close to 3,000 people, so these were really big gigs. Um, Banks of Coal offered a, a really exquisite demonstration uh, that despite the horrors of the recent past, a Khmer art and culture has an enduring role in our common story and that it is creativity which vouchsafes our collective future. Um, thank you for listening. I hope this perspective was interesting. I would so much rather be in a conversation uh, than presenting like this. Uh, I remain very proud of Banks of Coal. Um, I adore the people that um, we worked with on this and the creative daring and finesse of the team, uh, the performers, the creators uh, and, and, and my colleague producers. Um, some projects need the whole world to wrap their arms around them and these are the projects which in turn give life back to us all. Um, so thank you everyone and um, thank you Jean-Baptiste and the CAL team. Uh, and everyone, take care. Bye. Uh, we're, so, we're so honored to welcome Tisa Ho.
Thank you, Rachel. Thank you so much. I feel like a Johnny come lately or, or you know, journey come lately, whatever, in, in this process, um, not having been a part of it from the beginning, but enormously privileged to have been allowed a little role in this discussion. I think commissioning empowers us all, um, those of us who make art, those of us who present performances, with, with co-commissioning, with working together, we, we have more resources, we gather the, 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 the abilities and the capacities of more than one. And coming together is really very often what the arts are about. So therefore, co-commissioning makes a lot of sense. Not, it's not always easy. And um, as anybody who works in partnership understands, uh, there, there are fantastic partners and sometimes a wonderful work result, as in this case. And partners go on to become friends, which is even better. And I sense that this is the case here. And of the people who, are, who I will have the, um, the honor and the privilege of having a conversation with are three who are really critical to this process. So I would like to bring them on perhaps one by one, starting with the man who, for, for, with whom this whole thing um, started and, and is, of course, an absolute force in the uh, Cambodian living arts today, right? And we, we know him from uh, what has been happening in this festival already. So um, my, I, I would like to address the first question to, to Fren and then to introduce Joe and to introduce Johnny who will join us with other questions from them so that we can have this conversation flowing. Um, um, if, if I can ask Fren and go back to actually prehistory, before this project, before um, um, the, 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 the project began even, to a couple of years when he was working, uh, when he brought a whole, a whole group of Cambodian artists to New York, um, I think it was 2013. How did, is, how did that happen and did that sow seeds for this enormously important collaboration then? When, uh, when Cambodian Living Arts uh, in 2013 um, organized and produced this huge, humongous festival called the Season of Cambodia uh, in New York in 2013, when we brought about 125 Cambodian artists to New York with 34 uh, venues uh, in the whole New York City during one month. Um, the process of, of pulling that amazing festival began also by connecting with uh, many people around the world, but especially in New York. Um, we, the way we were able to connect with, with presenters in New York was to invite them to Cambodia. And it was the beginning of, of a process where, you know, at that time uh, we, we pull out a really small funding, a seed funding from the Asia Cultural Council to sponsor a trip for five uh, presenters from New York to come to Cambodia. In that trip, uh, there was someone from the Asia Society, uh, someone from um, a dance, dance festival, now I, I had a blank, but also uh, at that time, the executive, uh, executive producer of the Brooklyn Academy of Music, Joe, who's in this panel. Um, and it was also my first uh, somehow professional engagement on hosting also major presenter from, from New York to Cambodia. And uh, we weren't sure how, how these international venue would look to our work uh, in, in the country. So we, it was a one week touring uh, on several places in Phnom Penh, in, in Batambang, we didn't have like the infrastructure of having a ready uh, theater and proscenium stage to present the work. And so most of the work have been seen kind of on more like rehearsal or even in those, those schools where things were happening. And it's from that that I think my relationship with Joe Melillo started uh, when, uh, you know, in his uh, rigid uh, uh, status of, of uh, the executive producer of BAM, I wasn't sure how I can even get him involved and interested to, to us because uh, at that time, uh, like I understood that he was a big name of, 
of this uh, of the presenting world around the world. So I was quite impressed uh, uh, by him and 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 um, and it's how it yeah. began because I always remember that time when when he saw the the work and the dress rehearsal of the Royal Ballet of Cambodia in the setup of the school. At the end of the conversation later on, uh, at the end of the presentation later on, I think just after lunch, he took me aside and he said, Plan, um, I really now understand the work that, that you are doing here in Cambodia. And I will, uh, the, well, the Brooklyn Academy of Music will present the Royal Ballet of Cambodia. If I remember, wow. if I repeat that, that, that conversation. And it, wow. it started wow. to begin the relationship between, I think, people to people that had built the institutional partnership and then leading to that when we had the bank school uh, commissioning, uh, I reach out to him and say, you know, we have this production, would you be interested? And it, and it, it, it began that way. Back. That's such a good that's such a good narrative, um, and and this is obviously the moment to bring in Joe Melillo, who knows the world, and, and you can't mention New York, you know, without mentioning Joe. He is one of the most preeminent producers. He's led the Brooklyn Academy of Music from strength to strength. Uh, he is that odd. Well, nowadays it seems odd, uh, but but actually it 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 applies this this comment applies to all of our speakers uh, in this panel, deeply, deeply rooted in his own nation and yet a complete internationalist. I mean, Joe has been honored by the governments of France, of Britain, of Sweden, of, uh, I, I can't remember, the, 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 the list of honors goes, goes on. You know, he's a cultural diplomat as well as a producer. So um, Joe, you know, the, the, I, I, we, can, we can take about two hours just going through this. But I would like to focus now to, to, to on your response. Was that your first visit to Cambodia? And how did you respond to the invitation? Uh, the answer to the question, first of all, practically, yes. That was my virginal inaugural visit to Cambodia. And um, it is uh, interesting to note uh, that a colleague of mine who's no longer with us, Sam Miller, would go to Cambodia with some consistency. And I had conversations with him, but the kind of, of curatorial work and what he was interested in didn't conform to what I think BAM uh, Brooklyn Academy of Music, I'll use BAM, the acronym. Um, the service that the institution can provide. So that's why I want to connect the dots between Fluin and my conversation, which simply for the season of Cambodia that he wanted to position in New York City the service that my institution could provide his objective was by putting the work of the largest scale on the opera house stage of BAM. The, the, it's, it was disarming to be able to see these very beautiful young women, some more mature than young, um, actually being sewn into their costumes in order to do this exquisite work uh, that I had never seen before. And I was certain that no one in New York City during the season of Cambodia would have seen it themselves. And so that there was like a, a dis, an amazing discovery, a very extreme traditional form with the background being um, artisanally, sensitively being reconstructed. And um, it, I want to make sure that I say the framing correctly that 
in my time with Mr. Prim, I understand his vision and strategy for Cambodia culture, for the Cambodia society, that how to enable this post-traumatic society, how to revitalize it through art and culture. And the phenomena was that this was one of the great artistic accomplishments of the culture of Cambodia. And I know that I could make it possible to bring that to New York City, which mm -hmm. gave it a context of, this is one of the great cultures of the world. And this is, it's, it's now reconstructing its art and cultural life. Thank you. Thank you. That That's a very thorough insight. I, I, we see this now coming from both sides, from, from the Cambodian perspective of reaching out to New York and, and from, from you, Joe, of seeing this, um, discovering, as you say, this amazing culture, this exquisiteness, um, and, and what it has to offer not only New York, but possibly the world, you know. Um, but I, I'm sensing, um, although you, the both of you are very modest about this, I'm sensing that was a real personal connection as well. And forgive me if this is pushing in, into a non-professional realm, but a lot of what we do in commissioning actually is based on relationships. Uh, we're putting our institutions, you know, to some degree at risk. We're putting our resources out there. We're, and we're getting artists to do stuff that maybe they hadn't even thought about before. So there's a lot at stake here. And the trust and the and the and the and the, the 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 linking between people, I think, on the basis of which great collaborations can happen, cannot be underestimated. So uh, I'd, I'd like both of you to 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 speak a little bit about this as well. Um, um, there's a higher higher priority, which is revival and Cambodia and and heritage and the arts uh, and and an international audience, but beneath that there is a very personal dynamic that I'm sensing and I'd love you to speak about. Oh, well, I'm going to be emphatic in telling you that at the foundation of this professional adventure that I had was a friendship with Fluin that I, I respect him immensely I, my, my life, my major career was to service the BAM and the New York City. Fluin was servicing a country with his vision. And I have rarely encountered an individual who wanted to tackle an an artistic and cultural strategy for their country. So you know, I, I spent a lot of quality time with this man and understood what direction he was going and how I could help him. And, and one of the things that I could help him to do was to remain objective about his thinking, about how he wanted to produce Banks of Coal. That, that was the end game of like, oh, you're going to get the best of my objective thinking about what you're telling me. I'm not going to allow the friendship to mess up. I want you to have my best thinking on the subject of how to get from A to B to C and to an opening night within a global context. I, I can totally see that happening on an administrative and management and resource allocation and contractual dimension, all of the nuts and bolts that make this work. But at the bottom of this, and, and this is the third layer, right? There's this enormous agenda that you both have in your respective organizations 
in, in your country, in, in one case, um, there is the, the wonderfully deep and, and, and respectful friendship. And, and then there's the nuts and bolts. But in there, in there, there's another layer, which is the artistic work. So I, I, I want to ask him, where were the, where, what bits, what parts of it were you driving? Uh, what parts of it did, did the co-commissioners come in with? I, either either uh, in New York and Melbourne for that matter. How does the selection of all the partner artists work? Uh, and at what point in the creative process did the commissioners, the, the co-commissioners, uh, you know, have, have input, have uh, uh, brought their way to bear on the process and the outcomes? Thank you, uh, and thank you, Joe. Uh, uh, I guess that's the one thing I'd like just to add on to kind of completing uh, Joe's uh, um, beautifully uh, um, shared um, uh, friendship is also, the, uh, Joe had been such a great mentor. Also, I think in the world that we're working uh, in the performing arts on arts and culture, uh, in fact, uh, being mentor by you know some of the most senior professionals in the industry is 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 really helping us in terms of guiding our decision uh, because uh, to, the the world this world is so big and it could be frightening but in fact I receive uh, so much uh, it's not just the friendship but the, the but the mentorship that that Joe had provided throughout all the different process of work that we had had so I just want to mention this. Uh, for for Tisa, um, you know, like I, so I run Cambodian Living Art is a grassroots. It used to be a really small grassroots organization, finding masters in countryside and then setting up classes in in those countryside with few staff and really like in in the supporting masters and the transmission of these oral tradition of Cambodia. We grew up out of that for on our first decade. And when I came as the executive director of Cambodian Living Arts, uh, I, I was enormously taken by that vision of, of the country. And I think uh, what Joe's mentioning is myself uh, being a Cambodian. Uh, I was born in Cambodia, but but fortunately, uh, I, you know, I, I escaped the genocide grew up in Canada, was educated, and it came back 21 years ago. Uh, and uh, my sense of reconnecting with my culture was so strong. And that can lead Cambodian Living Arts. And I think connecting to what Joe says is the organization really had a, a bold vision of, of, of helping to support the sector and the country as a whole. Uh, from that, my work is just to carry uh, the legacy of, of the transmission that had happened with the masters and the students, but also to share it to the world. But I've, I've, I wasn't a producer or executive producer, neither like even like that, those terms that I've learned throughout like commissioning and all of that, that learned throughout working in the field. Uh, but I was, I had that passion. And from that passion, I started just to meet people. Uh, and, and I guess, you know, maybe lucky in this world is that I've met really interesting, influential, uh, and uh, meaningful people uh, through the work that we have done through fundraising activity, through uh, a meeting with people. And so from that, why I'm, I'm setting the context is because, the, as you said, Tisa, you point out, it's by building those relationships that we then uh, find the directions to push important projects like the season of Cambodia or Bank's goal, because there's no way we could pull it out on ourselves because we would not have the funding, we have uh, the presenter, and neither also the artistic collaboration that is needed. Uh, from the beginning, Bank's goal started with a beautiful, meaningful project. It is totally mission driven. It's not about like the work of one artist that wants to be stages, but it's about the mission of why we are producing this work. So Dr. Him Sopi, the composer, you know, composed this requiem with a sense of, of his own story, of, of what he endured during the genocide. 
And when I, I heard the first bits of the first six or seven minutes of the music, I'm not a music specialist, but I was taken by the music. I, 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 yeah, I, I had goosebumps on, on, on just like listening to it, but I, I didn't know how that would perceive. And I thought like, maybe if we were to look at only a music concert, uh, it will not tell the whole story. So I, I, I didn't know much Richie Pan. In fact, at that time, the, the Cambodian filmmaker, but I've seen his work. So I, I, I introduced him to the music of him, Sophie, and I started to create that artistic collaboration together. And mm. both of them didn't know each other well and never worked together, but were inspired again by the idea and the mission of the work artistically. And they came together. Yeah, so, that, it's, it's, a, it's again about bringing people together. Uh, yeah. and, and I think uh, since you talk about music, uh, it's a perfect cue to bring in the other panelists who's been waiting in the waiting room. I'm sorry <laughs> to keep you so long, Johnny, but these conversations no are problem. fascinating. It was hard to break into this. Um, there, the, I, I want you to bring you in right now for, for two reasons. One is because uh, Fleur mentioned music and you are the specialist in this. I mean, Johnny's uh, uh, involvement in music is deep and wide, particularly in choral music. Uh, and, and his organization has something like so different from, from the Cambodian um, um, arts one, has something like 40 different uh, organizations within this, this umbrella, right? And, and he's active in the choral work throughout Asia and, and in, indeed the world. So uh, another person who is deeply rooted in his community and yet entirely globally facing. So what was your impression of this process and also working and this is where the co-commissioning collaborating dynamics come in again, working with an organization that is structurally <clears throat> so different from your own. Um, we first heard of this project, Banzoko was in, I think, 2016. And, you know, at that time, uh, to be honest, we, we knew very little about Cambodia. It's a name of a country. We've never been uh, visited there before, but we saw this project and this project is so interesting for to us because uh, it's uh, the, it draw the inspiration from the Cambodian history and the traditional music. And it requires Cambodian traditional instrumental instruments and Western orchestra and choir and also film and theater, everything. And as Tisa mentioned before, my organization, Taipei Philharmonic, is an organization that has 10 choirs, three orchestras, musical theater, and opera. So this is a perfect project for us to, you know, to, to, to try to get involved and to get to know a different culture. And uh, the process, you know, I have to say it's difficult for us first because, uh, First of all, the, the choir, the singing in uh, such, you know, such difficult language. It's it's not Cambodian. It's actually an ancient Buddhism sutra, the Pali. We, we couldn't understand anything of that. Fortunately, we found a monk who's from Sri Lanka, and was happened. He happened to be in Taiwan studying at that time. So through this kind of collaboration and work, we learn more about this piece. And uh, we did our first um, workshop in Taiwan, which is, I think, the first time everything put together. And at that time, that was the first time we saw Riti Ban's film. And it was that moment we realized that everything, every work that we've done was worth it because it was so moving. Uh, all our players and singers were you know, crying after our first dress rehearsal because we, I mean, through the music, we know that it is a powerful, but with the film together, everything combined together, we know that we are making a history and we are very, very happy and honored to be a part of this. And then after that, we, we started to, you know, perform in different places and we did some, you know, changes through time, but all in all, the, this experience for us, for our singers and players, it was an unforgettable hmm. experience. But how, how did the first connection happen, Johnny, between you and Fren? Was This was an invitation. So we know that in 2013, there was an invitation to a group of presenters. Um, you were not party to that. 
No, uh, not. At the time, yeah. And I know, and, and we know from this conversation that Flem reached out to Sophie, to, to the filmmakers, to various people to put the, the creative team together, as it were, uh, aided and abetted and guided and mentored by the redoubtable Jeremy Lilo. Uh, and, and so your, your connection, how, how, I, I, think, I think people interested in how these collaborations happen um, might be curious to know, and as I am, of, of how that contact, how, how that was done. Um, uh, well, I, either of you could, could answer that. <laughs> go, go, <laughs> ahead. Go, go ahead, Johnny, Johnny. and I can complete. Okay. Um, we actually first heard of this project from the Ministry of Culture of Taiwan, because uh, uh, they got this information from them that they have this project. So, and they were looking for an institute that can manage all these different things. Because at that time, I believe Flamengo was already have this piece almost finished and looking for a place to do a workshop, to do a test run, to do the final adjustment. And that's where, uh, when we heard from our Ministry of Culture that there's, there was this project. And my colleague, Esther, uh, she actually met Plum the year before in, I believe it's in Melbourne, Melbourne Festival. So when I mentioned this to our colleagues, uh, Esther told me that, oh, she met Plum before and he has some, you know, um, uh, he, he heard of this project too. So that's when we started to look into this project. And mm -hmm. in December, 2016, I was invited to come to, to watch the rehearsal or uh, at that time, I, uh, it, it was Gideon working with the dancers and trying to put together this uh, theatrical piece. And that was my first time visiting uh, Cambodia. And that was my first time actually looking at the score and, and the piece. So then we decided that um, this is a project that we can do and this is the project that we must do. Okay, so what I'm getting is that, uh, again, that, that human dimension, that dimension of somebody that, that as, as Joe had defined, so there's, there's a passion, there's a real mission, uh, there's an alignment of missions of the parties, and then on top of that or below that, are supporting that, you know, wherever that is, um, a real personal connection uh, and mutual respect and admiration. I, th I think um, that that those are those are the most wonderful and precious ingredients to, to to come together to make a project like this succeed. And congratulations to all of you on this phenomenal success, on this phenomenal work that's been created. Now, one of the things about these sessions is that there's a limit on time, and so. Uh, I, I think we have, you know, moments for last words on this panel before we probably need to be uh, keep quiet and, and be shunted back into some, some sort of waiting room. So, um, Joe, would, were you, did you want to say something? Yes, you say I, something? I, I wanted to compliment your artistic statement and observation because the response to the project was purely authentic by all parties. And in, when you encounter authenticity, and which is based on humanity, it's a very disarming truth. And you, uh, there's a certain intrinsic beauty in this path. And that has been the success of Banks of Coal, and everyone was doing their best work. And the credit to Rachel Chanoff, who was m the earth mother of driving the project to its multiple opening nights, and again, thoughtful, insightful decision-making sensitive to the artists, sensitive to the presenters, and coming to a path to get to the opening night. My final words, Tisa. Thank you, Joe. Um, Johnny, before we, we go back to Flem. Um, 
this is uh, this project is really brought a lot of uh, a lot of impact to to as you say our singers our players and also those audience who were in the workshop presentation because it's it's been three years now but there are still people asking uh, when are you going to bring that complete work back to Taiwan because there were a lot of audience, a lot of presenters in that audience for that workshop presentation. And uh, for this kind of work, it's not just an artwork, it's the, the meaning behind it, uh, the humanity, which is the, the, you know, the, the, the united language for the whole world. And this is the thing that people will pay attention to and should pay attention to. So hopefully we can bring this peace to many more places in the future. Thank you, Johnny. And Glenn, the last word to you before we hand this back to Earth Mother. Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 just to, to, to wrap up the, the, the session and also kind of connecting is um, one part that people might have asked is like, how do they fund it or how do they make it happen? But in fact, we, we've never had like, it's not like we've received like the, the funding and we knew how to spend it and to make the process happening. In fact, it's through each of the processes, uh, it's a mixture of, because it's so much mission driven, it's a mixture of partnership uh, and of course some funding, but it really began by the partnership. The partnership with the Taipei Philharmonic Orchestra was because we didn't have a choir and I was looking for a choir within the region. I wanted a choir that, that is Asian, uh, that can, can, be, can be sensitive to, to the language itself, even though we are talking about a, a, a language that has appeared. And I wanted to bring Asian together. So we connected with the Taipei Philharmonic in this way. We also work with them because we didn't have a proscenium stage in Phnom Penh. So to, to workshop it, we needed a space. So they, they contributed you know, those space and that, that expertise to us. So it was really building the partnership that led us so to ways of funding. And I think in this time of, of the world and, and where we are, it's impossible to have like a million dollar funding to make something. You have to believe in the how artistically and, and mission driven your project is and then connect with people that can come and support the work that you're trying to pull out. And it's the way then from, from as, as I think Joe said, like from, from having, finding the right producer like Rachel Shanov in her uh, production office to believe in this project and not charging us at, at the beginning a big fee, but, but believing that she will accompany the process so then, you know, she she gets a way to get involved, and so through every like every step of this process, like money was not like what had driven us. It was the mission, the creative process, the partnership, the friendship that had led us for for, for making and presenting then this Cambodia product to the world stage of the Melbourne Art Center, Melbourne, and the Melbourne. International Festival, and then to Brooklyn Academy of Music, to the, the Arts Emerson in Boston, and then to Philharmonie of Paris, and then back to Cambodia. So this has been really beautiful. And I hope that we will be, as Johnny said, like continuing to, to tour this world. Um, and especially in this time of, of the pandemic, why, why arts matter? Uh, and, and, and you know, through difficult time, how do, we, how do we become resilient and strong and continue? what we're doing. Thank you so much. Thank you all for all of the wisdom and, and the, I have so many keywords buzzing now to take away from this. And I hope that other people watching will, will have this as well. Um, for me, there were, there were two important takeaways, uh, including one, don't be afraid of big ideas without the resources. And two, you don't need to have the complete work to show people. So find a school hall, it's a showcase. It's what you're thinking about. I think Joe, from Joe came that word authenticity, um, from Flem vision, you know, and from Johnny, the partnership. So thank you for the privilege of having this conversation with you. And I think my job now is to hand this back to the redoubtable Rachel, Earth mother of this project, to correct, write up. Correct. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'd like to thank such a brilliant panel of creators and Tisa for guiding us through and for being a force in our world. 
And uh, I just want to also say that in things like this, you see it takes commissioners and artists and mission-driven producers. And in this particular case, it also took the audience. The audiences from all over the world it was extraordinary because we were in all of these festivals where you usually look out and see a bit of a homogenous audience. And then everywhere in the world we went, there was the Cambodian diaspora was in the audience and was so moved, not only by the piece of art, but a piece of their own history. And the diversity of age was extraordinary. There would be grandparents and grandchildren who had never discussed this before. And it was the moment of catharsis. And, and of course, art is cause for catharsis, but this was so real. You could feel the moment in, the, in every audience where they were connecting in such a visceral and personal way and over generations right there in front of you. So that made it just a really, really rare experience that took it beyond art into people's lived experience. Um, so an honor to be a part of that. So thank, thank you all so much. And if uh, everybody, you can also go to bangsicle.cambodianlivingarts.org to view all of the panels in this festival and also to find out about the arts healing um, 2020 challenge, which everybody is invited to join. So hope to see you at the rest of our festival. Bye.